Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIX serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD cybersecurity and information systems research. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I'm the technical lead for the Cybersecurity Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC. Before we get started today, I would like to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSIAC webinar announcement. You can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say download presentation. Uh, second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat window on the lower right hand side of the webinar screen. You can chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. Uh, however, if you'd like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, uh, please click the three dots labeled more slash panel options to bring up the Q&A window as part of your layout. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q&A. Uh, for the benefit of those on the phone, I'll read the questions out loud to the presenter. If you have any technical issues, uh, during the presentation, have no fear, the full presentation will be available online. Please check back to the CSI website. Uh, once the webinar is posted, the go to webinar button will take you to the CSI YouTube link. With that said, uh, I would like to introduce today's presenter. Uh, Bill Newhouse is a cybersecurity engineer at the NIST NCCOE. He, he co leads the migration to post quantum cryptography project in collaboration with industry and government which shares insights on practices that will ease the migrations of PQC algorithms resistant to quantum computer-based attacks. His work initially focused on telecommunications, then information assurance and cybersecurity. Mr. Newhouse studied electrical engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology and holds a master's degree from George Washington University. Bill? Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for joining me today. Um, watching the video reminded me, well, I, I worked for the DDRE, the title at the time, the Director of Defense Research and Engineering, from 2005 to the middle of 2007. And at that point, we called it information assurance more than we called it cybersecurity. But uh, it's fun to have been focused on cybersecurity now for nearly 20 years uh, directly and before that telecommunication. So thanks for joining me. Staying ahead of the curve today, the the, the, the idea there can be two can be thought of in two different ways. There's a bell curve that you might have experienced as a student where you're where the people get A's and B's are on the right side, the A's especially on the very far right side of the of the curve, and that's ahead of the curve in some respects. And so so, you know, being being in the, the prepared and getting good grades model of staying out of the curve, but also just the more literal, you're on your bicycle and you're you're riding around a curve on a bike path or in your car and staying ahead of the curve is, is, is uh, you know, a benefit to know what's coming up and what you need to worry about. And, and, you know, sometimes it requires having been on the curve a little bit in advance, but also just tactics you can take. So that's why we cho I chose that name and planning for the migration to post-quantum cryptography 
uh, is focused uh, uh, you know, is the focus today. I'll give you all the context. I hope that will make you understand the challenge and potentially more about your role within it. And I look forward to your questions as we move along. So let me get my screen working here. Um, today I'll be covering again this project. We have some deliverables. So I'll be sharing a little bit about those uh, two publications that have come out, and then. Uh, talk a little bit about the tactics uh, within the non-national security part of government uh, to focus on validation of crypto algorithms and validation of of crypto modules within technologies a little bit and a uh, high level touch on those and then uh, where we're moving within the project is to is to start to support the the risk management aspects of of prioritize, prioritizing migration um, and so we'll, get, we'll we'll have slides on all of that and the picture to the right is essentially our web page. So if you Google NCCOE and PQC, just those five characters and you know, and then three characters PQC, you'll find the web page and, and it's a place where you can keep up with what we're doing. There's always a status page in the middle right side of it. And at the bottom, you can sign up for updates to join us as we continue along. We have a community of interest, which is essentially a, a fancy mailing list that uh, you can leverage to keep track of where we're going and, and what we've been doing. All right, to frame the challenge, uh, the focus here is that is, is in 1994, uh, Peter Shore, um, I put out a publication that, that said, hey, eventually quantum computers will be able to do quantum cryptanalysis. And the, the key here is that the quantum computer enables the analysis to happen at a, at a scale that's incredibly faster than classical computing. So. Uh, and, and the gist of this, I'll try to offer as a non cryptographer, but as a person who understands a little bit of this there, there, we rely on, on discrete logarithms and, and large integer you know, prime prime number integers that are hard for classical computers to, to break the math on without, you know, taking de decades. And so that means that the, the, the keys that are developed and the, the digital signatures that are enabled by these these tactics are are secure for that length of time. But now in 1994, Peter Shore said, hey, look, we, we believe mathematically a quantum computer can do this. OK, so 1994 quantum computers were way th more theoretical than they are today. So as we move from the, you know, there to now, um, we, we've, we've got some progress to talk about. Um, and so the, the threat is that somebody will implement Shor's algorithm on a quantum computer, and you'll, you'll, you've probably watched in the news that quantum computing and the number of qubits and things like that are, are growing all the time. There's a large investment in that space. So there's, there's a, a notion that that'll happen. Uh, I can't tell you when. I'm not that smart, but there's you know, the idea that the, the, the a quantum computer that can do Shor's algorithm will exist in the future. There's a, a tactic that could be happening to you and your data right now, which is at harvesting it now and decrypting it later. So uh, manipulations on traffic on the internet and other things could allow for your, your data that's been pushed out into, into you know, channels that are available for others to monitor or, or exploit, um, include your data and your keys. And then you know, later when they have a quantum computer, they could break that data. So. So the threat here in the picture, which came from a, a Canadian publication, which is linked on the bottom, is it's going to take us a while to migrate to, to new algorithms that will protect against this quantum computer. So that's that's one of the things. The response is to have standardized post-quantum cryptography, and that it, standards will you know are are vital. And NIST has been leading that that charge for uh, for the government, and and there'll be adoption in both non-national security and, and national security systems of these new algorithms. So that migration time is something today you haven't migrated to any PQC or in some cases you have vendors who've offered you draft standards of PQC and their technologies because they control both ends of the pipe. You have data that's in green, which is the shelf life. How long is it valuable? So if somebody does harvest now, decrypt later, if they decrypt it in five years, is it dangerous? Is it da data that you don't want to have anybody else see five years from now? Is it data you don't want somebody to see 15 years from now? So that shelf life, you know, is a variable depending on what you know about your data. And then that threat is the red line is when does a quantum computer exist that can run Shor's algorithm? And if that one happens before your your shelf life is over, you may have exposed data you don't want to see out there and, uh, you know, out there being used and exploited and, and, and put back against you so that's why we ask people why migrate to post quantum computer because these things are, are are possible and then the challenges that we ex bump into with this migration is that not very many organizations have a complete picture of the the dependency on public key cryptography 
and public key cryptography is key pairs, public and private keys that are are used to communicate with entities that you don't have uh, prearranged keys. So there's a thing called symmetric cryptography. I, I know the key, you know the key, I've managed to deliver it to you in a, in a secure means so that you can implement on your end and my end. But if we don't have that ability, we rely on public key cryptography and a lot of the communications on the internet um, you know, do rely on that. So we have a, a large tech base of, of use of public key cryptography. And cryptographic migrations take a long time uh, in, in recent history. There's been deprecations of things like SHA-1, a, a, a hash algorithm, and, and moving it to, to the new algorithms you can still find when people do inventories that SHA-1 may be in, enabled in technology that it hasn't been deprecated. And there are other examples that are discovered. And so migrations are rarely complete and this one will take a long time. All right, moving forward. So now I frame the, the challenge. I have the privilege of working at the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. It's part of NIST. NIST is part of the US Department of Commerce. We're a non-regulatory agency. We're a, we're a science or you could, you know, sometimes our director says we are the, we are the laboratory for the US economy and, and NIST has lots of different focus areas, but I work in the information technology area and, and in particular cybersecurity and applied cybersecurity. So we, we pick projects here at our center that allow us to to demonstrate to different audiences in different sectors and different technology bases, things that, that they might not have known were easy to accomplish or easier to accomplish than they expected that haven't been uh, fully adopted, but standards exist in those spaces. So we're pushing. This one has that nice upside downness. NIST is doing the standardization right now. There are no final PQC, post quantum cryptographic algorithms uh, available. So. We're complementing the standardization effort that's being led by colleagues here at NIST, and I'll describe the timeline a little bit more. We are we are supporting White House and uh, memorandums, National Security Memorandum 10, uh, DHS, DHS CISA is part of this as well. We are tackling the challenges of, of adoption of post-quantum cryptographic algorithms, in particular the ones that NIST is standardizing. So we're not focused on any other mitigations uh, of risk from the, the threat of the quantum computer except for the ones that can be achieved by implementing the new algorithms. We're focused on implementation and deployment. And we've we've got that community of interest I described to you. And then the other thing is we invite collaborators to join us. We we are coordinating with standard developing organizations that those internet protocols that we use, transport layer security, SSH, those are international standards that are not, you know, just US owned and, and, and you know, operated kind of standards. They are standards that come out of, of technical bodies that people meet regularly to update. And those organizations are updating standards to support post quantum cryptography. And we're communicating where we have some of them, some of the big players with us in our collaboration. So it's, it's a, it's a two way street here on the communication. And we have focused on the last two bullets in, initially. Where do you have quantum vulnerable cryptography? Where is the asymmetric cryptography that you're using that has public private keys uh, in your hardware, firmware, software, and other protocols and the services you use? And then now we're gonna focus on a risk-based approach to help you prioritize the, what you learn from your inventories. The discovery is an inventory. And then the bottom one is that um, because these, these algorithms are new, they're larger, they're different than the uh, current algorithms, and they need to be demonstrated. And so some of our collaborators have worked together to do interoperability and performance, and they're exploring TLS and QUIC and SSH and other aspects of code, code signing, public key certificates, hardware security modules is a tactic as well, where people leverage those to, to help manage keys. And so we have different vendors who are all doing testing together to, to explore what can be done with these algorithms, what we know about them, and, and the performance hits that we'll express as we, as we move to using them. Our collaboration is uh, includes inviting technology companies to join us, and so each of these collaborators have signed a cooperative research and development agreement with us to bring their expertise and often their technologies into a lab environment that we have here at NIST. And if you look across this list, there's two federal organizations mentioned, CISA and NSA, they're partners in this. And then these companies have, have, have signed CRADAs. And if you look, Notice that you'll see an Amazon on there. You'll see uh, Microsoft, you'll see Cisco, you'll see Palo Alto. You'll see big providers that you rely on for technologies in your organizations. And, and 
that they're mostly focused on the interoperability and performance. Some of them have tools for discovering where cryptographic algorithms exist as well. So they're they're in both of our work streams. We have the work stream on inventory discovery, and we have the work stream on interoperability and performance. Others are experts in, in hardware security modules. They have expertise in different protocols. They support all, all aspects of things. There's a few financial services organizations who are going to be, um, because of the maturity and the support they have to, you know, for their networks and their need for security, they're they're often staying ahead of the curve. And so their expertise and their experience, and the fact that they've hired cryptographers and physicists to really understand quantum technologies in a big way, make them excellent partners with us as well. So, again, these are a, a list of different folks who've who've joined us and and. Uh, it's a it's the largest collaboration we've ever had at our NCCOE, and and it's fun to manage. We meet on, on a regular basis for discovery weekly, and then right now because the standards are going to the NIST standards for post quantum cryptography are going to go final this summer. Three of them. Um, that means that the interoperability performance will redo some tests that they did on the on the draft standards uh, after that, and so they've pulled back to meeting uh, just once a month, and then we get together monthly to talk about what else we could be doing together. In a timeline slide, this shows our project timeline. Note that we started in 2018. We asked people to, to join us uh, by posting a, a, a description of our work. We, we, we had some workshops and papers that led to it. The memorandum called for us to, to exist in May of 2022. And we, we had our first kickoff after inviting folks to join us with the Federal Register notice that went out in October of 2021. We, we started with first 14 collaborators in June of 2022. And then the publications, uh, we use special pub 1800 series, in this case, dash 38. And, and those volumes B and C are expressed in the work streams I described. The standards, the FIPS documentation, Federal Information Processing Standards, one, you know, they exist. They've got the names MLCHEM, MLDSA, and SLHDSA. Those are the three new PQC algorithms that have been worked on and understood since uh, 2016 by, by NIST cryptographers and mathematicians who focus on cryptographic technologies. And they've worked their way through a process for the last eight years such that they'll become standards this, this summer. And the box that says we're focusing on, on a risk-based approach is gonna be something we'll publish in the near future to, to, to share with you a technical things about how to move you know data around in this in the technical way from inventories into a system that can digest it and help you do analysis, but also just uh, the value of doing so. Um, I'm going to go back to this. 26, 2018 was when we started this. 2016 is when NIST started the process to say we're going to we, we want to identify post quantum cryptographic algorithms. Post quantum is a descriptor it means these are algorithms that should be in place when a quantum computer can break the current quantum vulnerable algorithm. So post quantum is getting getting these algorithms in place just before, you know, in advance of that quantum computer existing. So maybe not the best marketing term to say post anything because people think they can wait. But since 2016, NIST has been pushing to get those standards uh, in front of people, pushed on, poked, prodded in a way that's open and transparent for the whole world to see. The algorithms don't come from NIST having thought them up. They come from international co coalitions of experts who've delivered them and many uh, you know, have been offered. I think we were over 80 to begin with and, and now down to just a few. And they're asking for more because they, they, they'll need, we'll need some diversity in the new algorithms to support not only protections against a quantum computer that could break the, the, the math, but also against the classical computer attacks that exist today on cryptography. So it has to have uh, the teeth of supporting just as good as today's to, to not be exploited by classical computing and breaking the math and the quantum angle. So the 2016 was the NIST start, but in 2006 is when cryptographers worldwide started saying Shor's algorithm from 1994 matters. We need to get going on this. So 2006 to 2016 was a, an annual conference and people started thinking about what would the cryptography be? And that led to those international coalitions submitting algorithms to the NIST uh, challenge process to, to be selected as, as, as NIST standards. So uh, we have two publications, um, cover sheets on the right, date of publication as initial public drafts on the left and, and, a, and a description of, of high level description of what you can find in each of them. The cryptographic discovery one, the B, 38B, offers some scope and context and, and how it might matter to your organization. We're trying to draw you into the challenge 
that's why I'm also here to draw you into the challenge to recognize that if you're from a big enterprise organization, this is something you may want to be part of because you know something about your data, your encryption use to protect your data and 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 there's going to be an, a need for a team to focus on this to get yourself to be quantum ready. The 38C is if you're a technology provider who has to put these algorithms in place, you, you, you want to look at the interoperability and performance. And then in both cases for these publications, uh, submitting, hey, I read it and I think you should also focus on this is something we want to hear. So our community of interest, if you join us, if you don't join us, you can still send emails to both publications. There's an email address in each that We'll draw attention to, hey, I think you should work on this and we'll try to respond and let you know if we do, and then you'll see it potentially in future versions. And that, that would be a generous gift of you as an audience to tell us what else you would like to see us do. Moving on into validation programs, there's an algorithm validation program. And the, the goal in this is that folks who have these algorithms and are gonna be using them, need, it's a wise choice to get them validated. Um, in this, in, and, and that means you know they've seen some more scrutiny. There's a, a private testing structure that NIST designs the test and private labs uh, administer them. And they've put together some things to support these new three, the three new algorithms. And, and I've offered the URLs there. Um, there's also a cryptographic module validation program. And, and for, for much of the non-national security part of government there's a process by which you should be using validated modules in your you know of crypto in your products and that would you know, enable us to to adopt faster and so this is a tactic for those who have technologies to to bring to the government for use and and some resources uh, also describe you know the, the the algorithms themselves and i'm sure you know, i'm leaving a lot of room for questions in these areas but i just want to give you the high level tactic for if you're if you're aiming to supply to the US government especially the non national security part the tactic of the the validation programs is important um, for the national security systems there's national information assurance partnership program niap um, and and the different tactics that rely on this to get to there so it's not unrelated but uh, I'll share that and and I'll I'll recognize um, if upcoming dot uh, F, sorry, not DOD, AFSIA TechNet in Baltimore at, at next week. There is a presentation by um, Dr. Bill Lawton on, on this space that will cover more of that national security angles of, of adoption of migration to post-quantum cryptography. So if you're near Baltimore and you're a government person, you can get to that conference for free. So that's AFSIA TechNet. Um, all right, so the work in progress within the project is, is we, we're going to continue interoperability and performance testing, and that, that'll up, update, you know, tables and charts of things that we've learned by, by playing with the algorithms, and especially once they're final, doing retesting of the ones that were done originally as drafts, uh, just in case a parameter changed by, by one, you know, order of magnitude of something like, you know, go from 256 to 512 or 768, you know, number of bits, things like that. Risk-based approach is, is in the discovery. What can we do with the data you've learned about yourself by, by doing the discovery? So we've, we're working on an architecture picture that will help you kind of understand there's a governance angle to this, which is part of the, the NIST cybersecurity framework, and that governs circles in yellow in the, in the new CSF 2.0. And then focusing on data assets, where, what, what do you know? What, do you, what can you learn about yourself? How to manage that information and put it into a risk management tool to start helping you do prioritization so you can make uh, mitigation and migration decisions under the right. So this is new work, but um, you know, up, up on the top bar says, you know, we're gonna be focusing in interoperability performance on IPsec and smart cards and DNSSEC areas that we haven't totally gone to. And then the, the, the volume that's on discovery, try to figure out how to show you the steps one to five and how our, how the technologies that our collaborators are bringing comes to bear on that and put it in a language that if it's in CSF language, there's a lot of adoption of that as a communication structure so that you can start to walk around uh, in your organizations and, and really draw, draw the right people into the conversations when it comes to data or management tools. There's a different organization, you know, you have, some of you may be focused on continuous diagnostics and monitoring. Well, that's gonna be, you know, part of number three there in, in a sense that, you know, we have lots of different assets and, and other things that are being re recognized through the CDM technology stack. The, inventory tools need to start integrating with that. More pictures about the CSF 2.0. I'm not going to dwell on these just to highlight that it has been updated this past spring to include govern. And this picture, I, I did a, a decent overview before. So 
those are just in case you, you, you want extra more slides to look at. Um, <clears throat> crypto agility, uh, we have our first big conversation on this. The memos that I mentioned from the federal government say you should think about crypto agility and, and vendors want to sell you crypto agility. And I would say, you know, 15 years ago, 14 years ago, vendors wanted to sell the U.S. government a lot of cloud security, and and they they would come at different agencies with different conversation starters, and they would have different technical depth to what they meant by security. And ultimately, NIST worked on on helping to frame what what cloud security meant in a way that allowed eventually the FedRAMP program to exist. And and wh whether you, you know, think it's made a big impact or not, it did normalize the language. And so crypto agility needs some normalization from a language perspective. And we've broken it down into these areas though this, thus far, and we haven't figured out exactly what we'll do in a lab environment at, a, at an applied cybersecurity lab where we work, where this project exists, but it'll be, you know, Picking from amongst these these challenge areas that, you know, crypto agility has some guiding principles. There are focuses on other security considerations that that you know, what does it mean to do agility? Does it change things, and and make other attacks more more viable by accident or you know by 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 being un, not, not as careful as one needs to be to set up this model. Um, is there a maturity to it? What are the legal considerations? You know, being able to move crypto in and out of things, um, and so trying to trying to come up with what it will be at the technical level. Those those mechanisms of protocols and APIs and libraries and, and accelerators will they exist? How do we use them? And then you know, are there going to be extra resources and performance things that are going to be need to be focused on? And I think the answer is all all yes. So it's a it's an area where vendors are talking about it and. The, the memos say to do it and and yet you know we don't necessarily have the first what's the best thing for you to do as an organization as you address crypto agility because um the the task here is to move to post quantum cryptographic algorithms that will protect us against both quantum and classical attacks and that for, for nsa they're asking please go straight to these algorithms don't offer me uh, hybrid implementations because they have the ability to control more of their supply chain in, in some aspects and and so that's one migration and so some of my nsa colleagues would say don't force people to do more than one migration they're complex they're hard enough anyway don't you know and then others say because of compatibility and the need to to be able to have backward compatibility with organizations and technologies that won't have migrated you're going to need to have hybrids that can establish the best cryptography when both ends can say yep i got pqc here let's go versus oh I, i'm not there yet let's stick with tls and a version that you know is got security but not against a quantum computer that may still be necessary to support the communications and the movement of data that you wish to support so the agility um if we can if we can do it well we can set ourselves up for all future migrations as any of these algorithms become uh identified as being vulnerable, well, you know, you're going to want a mechanism for swapping it out. So everything we can learn about their size and the, the how it works and interoperability will support the questions of how do you build a structure that will allow you to quickly move to new algorithms as they become available and standardized. All right, I only got a couple more slides, so there'll be plenty of room for you to, to talk about the questions you have. Um, this is a paper. Uh, at the bottom, I gave the, the, the URL to it. It is from the Global System for Mobile, um, and it's an association, the GSMA. And in February 22nd, they put out a use case uh, guideline for the telecom and, and you know, its migration to post-quantum cryptography. And they came up with two giant big areas that what are the, what are the use cases for, for them inside their mobile network operator structure? To, to offer and move to post quantum cryptography and the, the, I'm not going to read them all to you and all the acronyms are, are not ones I'm completely familiar with, but there's seven of them and each in this guideline document, they, they, they consistently describe what these seven mean and offer good details in a, in a way that allows you to look at one and then the next one and, and kind of start to gain a, a really deep understanding of, hey, I have a public key infrastructure, where am I going to need to look uh, for these algorithms to be to be used within that, not just the big words post public key infrastructure, but what technology within that PKI system uh, is is the one that will need some focus. Uh, so that's important. The, the next slide, uh, my second to last slide, says, "Hey, now I've got use cases that are going to be to my customers. You know, you and I as mobile users, um, you know, we're going to need quantum safe virtual private networks." 
the software defined wide area networks, all these kind of things that will be established. You know, look at the, the use cases, electrical smart meters, they're going to need to focus on and things that, you know, automotive, automotive is. So these are more use cases, again, seven more, all described consistently, everyone. Um, all right, so then the last one is, you know, I'll leave it up for a, a while while we, we get to the questions and answers part of the, of the, the time together. We have a project website. I already mentioned we have a, a an email address that I'm one of the recipients on. So you know we make sure we offer answers unless they're just junk email, um, and you can contact us. And then the crypto agility conversation. You know, don't bug Lily too much, but she's our she's our our NIST fellow for cryptography, and she's going to help us really frame that crypto agility and what can be done here at the center and what else needs to be done outside of the center uh, with our with with all cryptographers and mathematicians around the world and the system builders who who put crypto into systems. Um, and then Chris Seely's name uh, is here for the validation program. Um, again, you can bug Chris or you can just Google FIPS 140 validation and, and look at some of the publications and inform yourself. So uh, I'll get out of the way and I recognize I won't have all the answers to the questions uh, and, and you guys could obviously hit return and give your own answers and I'll offer some feedback of anything I've heard that's related to them and uh, you know, some of them will go from there. So Phil, Phil you got a set you want to start with or? Any recommendations where I should go first? I'd scroll up and look at the questions. Yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation, first and foremost. Um, but we do have a couple questions in the Q and A in the chat. Uh, so I'll start I'll with Ben. Start with... I'll start. I'll start with Ben Schmidt's. Okay, just in the chat. Okay. Sure. Yeah, it says, it says, "Do you need a quantum computer to do post quantum cryptography?" That's a good point. These new algorithms are designed to work in your silicon, in in your you know, which means in your current computing base, your mobile and, and laptop and computers and mainframes and things like that. Um, so no, you don't, it, there's nothing, that we're, we're sort of the anti-quantum, we're protecting against the quantum computer, but when I get invited to conferences that are about quantum computing, I'm there to say, well, there's one type of quantum computer that's gonna be bad for the world and we, we're developing post-quantum cryptographic algorithms for our, our current computing and memory systems. And that includes operational technologies and industrial control and SCADA and all that. We need to focus on, on if there's a threat to those systems from a quantum computer to the data that you're gonna to wanna to put these algorithms in place in silicon. So, I'll let you guide me the rest of the way, Phil, on questions you think I should take. No, no problem. Um, so Ben also had another question. He says, how long does it take to generate these keys with PQC algorithms on standard PCs? You know, I don't have that off the top of my head uh, from our from our publication, so I, I don't want to you know, give a swag and, and mess it up. Um, the keys are, are, they have larger message sizes, just larger key sizes, so it is, it is Longer, there are some, uh, I saw some tests that were presented at the fifth PQC standardization conference that NIST held, and I can grab some of these URLs and throw them into the chat, that, that explored some of the, the performance hits and, and a little bit of the findings of, yeah, that's not a big deal when you're in a, a bandwidth, you know, non-constrained environment, but when you get to constrained environments, then we start having to focus on, on use cases that start to say, well, maybe, yeah, the PQC algorithms will never fit here, and that's why NIST is exploring more to you know, consider for standardization because there's going to be a need to to talk about the the you know performance for constrained environments and and devices that don't have a lot of memory and 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 CPU power. So, uh, good question, and and I'll I'll see if I can get an answer uh, from one of you know I'll look one up as we go, but I don't have a, a number to give you, but it is longer. Okay. Uh, next question from Peter, is it planned to have a fully open source and patent unencumbered implementation of all pertinent al algorithms available from day one post ratification? If so, will an open source implementation be fully validated, making it available to everyone, avoiding major costs of validated product products throughout the ecosystem? Uh, the patent issues have all been addressed. So anything that's becoming a, that is already a FIPS draft that will become a FIPS standard this summer um, are are fully available to be implemented. The the nuance to the question that I think I'm hearing is you know there is a, a a bit of a burden to go do the validation process. You you have to submit and and it's not uh, it's an encumbered process that isn't isn't happening you know at a pace that makes everybody happy so uh, i don't believe there'll be 
you know, from us at NIST, here's one you can just put in place. But um, I would think collaborators like Wolf SSL would be able to describe they've implemented it in a, in ways that um, an open SSL would offer some opportunities to 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 find implementations that are are open and, and available. So kind of a, a mixed message there. Yes, not not encumbered by patents. There will be some who will create them. NIST will not be the ones that validate their use. They still have to go through a validation process, but they'll be available. Thank you. Uh, our next question, is there a wish list page for PQC applications? Um, that's a good idea. No, we don't have a place where you can, you know, except for submitting an email to the, the address that's still on the screen, applied-crypto. Um, we don't have a, a place where you can hit and hit submit and, and have it show up for everybody to see, but it, 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 it kind of behooves us to, to get those use cases from you. So please do submit. And then if we can figure out a way to, to make that like a table that we update every once in a while on a fact page, that that's a, that's a worthwhile consideration. Thank Good you. idea. Uh, next question from Chris. Not that security through obscurity is generally recommended, but as one layer of defense in depth, does limiting access to public keys mitigate the theoretical PQC attack by decreasing the likelihood of an adversary from being capable of decrypting content? The the math part would be if they have access to the public key and and if, and, and understand the communications between the two parties, then then it, the quantum computer will will exploit that. So you know th th there are other tactics um, for mitigation of risk, and 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 in, in this case, the, there'll be a new key exchange mechanism algorithm that's available that won't be able to be broken. So the the goal would be you know if you have the ability to implement the, the the chem key exchange mechanism algorithm then you know you don't have to worry about it but yeah you can one of the things that's immature in this space you know staying out of the curve is is they've the federal government had put out had, did put out an m2302 memo which said you know migrating to post quantum cryptography agencies please submit on an annual basis the non-national security agencies submit uh, an inventory of high value assets and high value systems. And it was a spreadsheet and they said, you know, you didn't have to buy tools to do the inventory. And so that data went into cyber scope. Is that the right name? Yeah. Um, from the, the DHS CISA hosts. And there's been a little bit of analysis of the 1st year. So, June 4th, 2023 was uh, sorry, May 4th, 2023 was the 1st deadline. And then June 4th this year, they had a better spreadsheet um, and and. The challenge is that they, who have they been asking? They've been asking the people who already knew about their their FIPS systems essentially, and they said, "Please tell us a little bit more. Don't just tell me you have crypto security controls, but you have what kind of crypto." And the ability to get those answers is not consistent across different agencies and departments. So, uh, this is my long-winded way of saying that was kind of the first introduction to, to many federal people. Hey, you need to do something and do it on paper and submit it. And then maybe also, they also asked for a cost estimate, what you think it would take to migrate, which had a, had a kind of a immature ask, like, hey, I don't even know what you mean by asking that. So so we're growing into the conversations and your conversation uh, about other ways to, to think about mitigating the risk is, is valid. You know, not everything needs to be migrated and not all data needs to be protected uh, for the length of time it, between now and when a quantum uh, crypto analytically quantum relevant quantum computer exists so there's some decisions to be made and and so in having come to this group i'm hoping that you know you'll walk back and be like hey i want to be part of our our quantum vulnerable you know quant start our quantum safe quantum resistant you know working group we're going to get there and and you'll be the one who walks in with other tactics besides you know moving to, to pqc so that was a, a, a little bit of a soapbox go back to questions i, I probably avoided the question but no worries, no worries. Uh, next question from Dwayne. How will co quantum computing coupled with high AI be controlled? Yeah, you know, I look at AI as requiring a large set of, you know, a la large language model to train and work from. And, and so that'll be a tactic to see if, if all the classical means to, to break crypto can be organized and usefully put together. You can make AI support your, your ability to look for vulnerabilities. I think, you know, that makes sense to me. I, I won't be able, I'm not a practitioner. Um, so there'll be tactics and, and, you know, frankly, I think AI will first continue to mess with the social aspects of getting access to our networks and data and not, you know, where it's not protected, where it's open and available. Um, so, you know, this is a, 
you know, it, it will, it will certainly not hurt, but it will take a lot of work from smart people to make those systems helpful to what they're doing. And those smart people may have the resources to take that on. So, um, you know, there are aspects of AI security that NIST is focused on with a quantum, uh, sorry, an AI safety Institute. And here at the center, a program that includes a, a tool called Dioptra, D I O P R T A Diop. P D I O P T R A Dioptra, and you can Google NCCOE and AI or NCCOE and Dioptra to to learn, look at you know is that a are we offering a resource that can help you uh, with security on of AI? But it's it's a it's, there'll be an impact, but I I can't anticipate exactly what it is. Thank you. Our next question from Phil: The number of qubits in quantum computing is rapidly growing. At what point? Uh, that is number of qubits. Do you think the current PQC algorithms become vulnerable? Uh, it's a while yet, and and that's all I can say. I don't ha I don't have that kind of expertise. There was a paper from this past summer that Carl Williams uh, posted and dra drafted and posted that talks about some of this. You know, some of those kind of things. There's a oh, there's a risk institute that a global global security risk institute that has a a, a, a counter. Um, I should get the links to these and I'll put them in the chat in case you haven't seen it. So, uh, again, yeah, they have a quantum threat report timeline. Um, and I'll put that 1 in here. So, uh, no answer from me and, and. Could happen in 5 years could happen in 100 over. Um, somewhat of a follow up question from Phil can side channel attacks make PQ PQC vulnerable. Side channel attacks are, are relevant for all implementations of crypto and, and so that's one reason these algorithms have to have to protect against them, you know, just the way we do today with, with the current implementation of, of RSA and Diffie Hellman and public key algorithms. So um yes, and 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 that's part of you know the there there's a PQC forum where cryptographers have been poking holes and pushing against and, and that's why some algorithms that were submitted weren't selected to move forward because they found things. Uh, but those are all good things to learn from and exploration of, of, of side channel attacks and, and other things is is also reliant on people implementing these algorithms on different devices. There's been some some research in that space. If you'll send that question directly to applied um the address that I still have on the screen, um, I'll, I'll find a reference or two to some research that's been done in that space, but it, it is still relevant. It, these aren't the, these, there's no new magic here. Implementation of crypto is complicated and tricky and you can then do, you know, the, the, there'll, there'll be th some things that these algorithms will be more resistant to, uh, but at the same time, they have to be resistant to all the ones that have been identified as being tactics uh, for the, the threat actors. Thank you. Uh, next question from Eli. What are your thoughts about using a distributed ledger approach to manage some of the items being mentioned? Yeah, distributed ledger blockchain. Um, I don't have a depth of, 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 we haven't done anything in our lab environment to explore those spaces. So, um, it it is a good question to ask uh, if if they need to be mo if any distributed ledger needs to be modernized and and if you have one that's exposed to everybody's use you know there's there's more to think about there um, I don't have a good paper to share or or a really good answer in that space it 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 may be a use case that we need to explore and we'll frame it and scope it and describe it and, and then try to do something in our lab but we have yet to do, do such a thing. Our next question, can we discuss paralyzation with respect to PQC? I can't, <laughs> but please do. Um, you know, uh, you're, you're getting into tactics of, of implementations that uh, I'm, I'm not expert in. Um, again, you could frame a question and I'll, I'll pass it on. Uh, if you Google NIST and crypto and paralyzation, if we have a paper on it, then, then in that paper doesn't say nice things yet about post quantum cryptography that implies a difference between parallelization and, and implementations, then then it'll be updated. So that's one other thing. I didn't I didn't share what the, the cryptographic tools group is going to build, but uh, amongst the things they're going to post is the FIPS documentation themselves. And then they're going to update some papers like 856, the series there that talk about public key cryptography. And there may be some other papers. So if again, I haven't studied parallelization implementations to, to be able to give you a, a better answer, but frame your question and I can take it to the collaboration and get you an answer back in the future. Next question from Eric. 
Uh, global navigation satellite systems are among those bandwidth constrained environments, 25 to 250 bits per second, where authentication is becoming more important. Is that a use case you are considering? Uh, not yet. Um, the center has been, been received a little bit of, of funding to do some work on, on um, space stuff, space systems, and, and we haven't integrated that thought yet to this project, but you're, you're talking about a, a really tough use case of technology that you can't just, you know, easily grab and change out because it's, uh, it's too far away. And that's true. A lot of industrial and other you know, embedded systems kind of thing where they get put into place and you can't do anything about them later. So there's a, a bit of a, you know, the industry should be aware that they, they ought to create the ability, the crypto agility to be able to, to swap out if they need to. Um, and that is obviously a, a strong area to do a lot of system security engineering and, and post quantum cryptography needs to be considered. So not, not a use case yet, but not, not, a, not, a, not out of the realm of possibilities. Thanks. Next question in the chat from Doug. Are rotating keys effective in a pre-QC algo world? What value will they have in a post QC algo world? Not in my in my expertise jar, so I apologize. I can't give you an answer. I imagine some others will have some thoughts. And again, uh, if you if you Google NIST and rotating keys, and there's a publication on it, then that should be a, a good starting point. But I have a hunch you have more expertise than the need to stop there. But uh, the tactics of of how to improve today's uh, Public key implementations. That's that's an interesting one. You know, I, I use the word prophylactic. Some people want to want to put a, a symmetric key around it, and that's that's a neat tactic. But if you can put a symmetric key around it, then you probably didn't need to use public key in the first place. But there are some places where you've already got embedded systems and things. So you know, the idea of putting a security boundary that does other stuff, and I don't I don't have a value statement about rotating keys. But if you can make something that you know that, that the thing I think pops in my head is if somebody can come back and, and offer an attack that used information that was just shared, you know, that there's a reproducibility word there, but, you know, there, there are already tactics that, that work on trying to make sure that, you know, that there's a counter and there's data that this sort of says this, this transaction can't be redone. So don't even try, but it's, it's, there's other areas where if they can come back and look like you uh, or if a signed document, you know, can be signed, a week ahead by a fraudulent means of, of having broken the keys then you know did, did you that did you did you just mess up the world from a contracting point of view that's a, a focus um, in, in this migration too which is the people who have lots of signed documents and digital signatures and their use will be a a, a carefully focused on place that uh, that will need some attention next uh Thank you. Our next question from Eli, have you explored how quantum might impact terrestrial versus space-based encryption and the systems leveraging those connections? I, I haven't looked up that industry space yet to see if, if any of the vendors are talking about, you know, what to do, but it, it really is, as said a moment ago, if you're putting out a new system, being able to create uh, enough compute space to, to deal with the new algorithms is probably wise and and so it needs to be thought of but uh, no we haven't we haven't done it we have not explored that um, if anybody knows of any other resources I I would imagine the DoD has taken on on some of those challenges already but uh, I'm not speaking from that perspective I, I work at NIST and national non-national security and migrating these standards we've, we've just you know kicked this project off it seems like a couple of years and it has been but uh, getting in front of people and trying to figure out these use cases keep 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 bringing them on because um, we need to we need to be, become clearer for different audiences as we move forward. Uh, next question from Eli: Are you considering financial use cases? Uh, what use cases do you see as the most critical to address first? Yeah, so the financial services sector, I, I mentioned we have we have a couple of different companies for, you know, working with us, and and some of them are are totally interested in the interoperability and performance because they run their own networks and systems, and they have some legacy. I mean, not, not legacy, but equipment that they they've done the engineering on um, for parts of their networks, and that's that's important to them. Um, one of one of our collaborators is definitely focused on the digital signatures and 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 contracts area. Um, so that's that's a critical use case um, that I think they'll continue to work on. And I'll recognize that they've they've got international or I mean they are they are already collaborating amongst themselves. So the um, FSISAC Financial Services 
Information Sharing Analysis Center exists and had a quantum security working group started uh, when I first met them in 2021. Does that sounds right? Yeah. And they've evolved to having a PQC Congress and they're, they're pushing on on uh, different standards. Um, and right now the, the algorithm, the, the, they they put they're putting together documentation to support that industry and they're being nice and sharing some of that with me as I share with them where we're where we're going. So I you know I think that I did address one use case which is digital signatures, but frankly just the the implementation of, of the algorithms in some of the protocols they rely on is is a strong focus. So they're they're pleased to be participating. Uh, quick I think is a is one that they leverage on occasion and and we've had a a few that said can we work on some you know a, another a communication protocol they've got, uh, and it may be that by the time we think about it, they will have have built you know based on looking at the work we've done on other standard communication protocols, they'll have figured it out for themselves, and they'll share it out within their community. But it is it is a strong area to focus on, and they're they're good partners. Our next question: Will collision and keys be part of PQC theoretically? Um, you're getting into cryptography and, and collisions are bad uh, by, you know, obvious reasons. And so, you know, yes, and, but I don't, I don't have a good, a good detailed answer to, to get you that one. Um, if you reach out to us through the applied crypto, I'll, I'll connect with the cryptographers. I mean, uh, as stateful hash signatures and collisions are a problem and, and hash signatures are leveraged in, in the crypto algorithm. So, um, it's, it's all. It's it's there, but I don't have a better answer than I know. I know the words you described, but I don't know how to give you know take take them beyond that. Or all right, thank you. Um, with that said, I'm monitoring the chat in the Q and A. Um, not seeing anything else come in. Uh, we just have another one come in. But before I, before I say that, uh, we'll continue to keep the the Q and A open. If you have any questions, um, definitely feel free. Um, our webinars are kind of unique at, for CSI as a one of the few resources where we can kind of be interactive um, with our community. For, for those of you who are interested in quantum um, PQC and quantum computing in general, um, our next webinar next month um, actually focuses on a quantum enhanced TCP IP protocol. So um, I, I assume a lot of you who are interested today will be interested in that as well. That'll be July 16th. So uh, feel free to, to join in for that one as well. Um, and on the way, I always make sure to um, fill out the survey. I would like to thank Bill again. Um, in the meantime, we'll we'll see. I see that one did just pop in the chat. So actually, let me address this one really quickly um, as well. Um, so our, the the follow up question we got from Eli says, "Are you seeing that crypto will need to focus on implementation hardware like using photonics versus electronics?" Ah. Uh... So quantum, you know, photonics and quantum, the use of quantum networking is 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 not presently a, a tactic that that NIST is exploring for for security as a standard standard kind of way of getting security. There's obvious considerations that physicists and the folks doing quantum information science will say you can't break things. I mean, as soon as you try to observe, it breaks and it won't work. That also can can mean denial of service could be could be somewhat simple. So as quantum information science advances, it eventually will walk into the room at NSA and, and NIST and other places to say, is that your tactic for security? This project, and, and the reason I don't know about crypto is I get to invite the NIST cryptographers to the, the collaboration meetings and they answer all the questions correctly uh, about crypto. Um, you know that's why you know I don't I don't have to know crypto I have to know how to use the process of getting folks created up so we can bring them and and their expertise and technologies to our lab and we can build stuff together. The the focus on on this is the electronic implementation you know in digital uh, hardware that's silicon based you know of these new PQC algorithms. So we're kind of we've scoped it down to these algorithms that NIST is standardizing for the world. The, the world did agree for the most part. Hey NIST, go ahead and run this process. We trust you know you'll do an open transparent thing. On on that, on that, and and many have promised internationally that that GSMA paper that I described, I should give you a copy of it in the chat. It it'll give you a good overview of all the international angles on this stuff, and and NIST is generous, you know, to have taken it on, and also the timing of us taking it on was like we were the right group to to have the resources to start on it. But uh, other groups are also thinking of other algorithms. But again, photonics versus electronics. Right now, it's all electronics or you know digital ones and zeros in silicon. Perfect. Thank you. 
Yeah, I believe that's all the questions in the chat as of now. I'd like to thank our presenter again uh, for being generous with his time. Uh, great discussion here that we've had in the Q and A. Um, NIST is a non-regulatory agency, but they have a, a wealth of information. Um, as you guys know, CSI does hold uh, the policy chart on our website as well. A lot of the NIST 800 series is on there. Um, as soon as there's up, updates to those policies, um, please check back to the to our website um, so you can get updated there. Uh, please check back to the website, the recording, as well as these slides. Are, the slides are up there now. The recording will be up there within a couple of days. Um, please fill out the uh, the survey. We're always looking to get ideas for new webinars, what you think of the content, um, the presentation, uh, the WebEx platform. Um, we're, we're, we're always looking for feedback. Um, but this was a great presentation. Um, and I thank you all. Hopefully to see you uh, next month.